Welcome. Thank you. Um, I think that was a, a pretty fantastic setup mm -hmm. because uh, it certainly delineates some of the issues, right? The opportunities. I often think, though, and you know, you you know both sides. In some ways, it's easier to be in opposition um, because you can describe the problems and you can be as critical as you like. Uh, and then you get into government, and it can be a bit like the dog that caught the bus. It is. Yes, I've been on both sides now. Um, what I would say is this: there can be a level of frustration being in opposition because you so want to utilize the skills that you've built up for my case seven years, saying, yeah, if I only had you know, that one more term, I could have done this. But the other side of it is um, it's always important to make sure that you're looking at the whole picture. And one of the benefits that a minister has is they have an entire department and data and they have lots of incredibly smart people who can draft you memos and teach you what's going on. Right. Whereas last night and this morning, I sat at my kitchen table and Googled a couple of terms to make sure I was up to speed on what was going on. So <laughs> I am nothing but for the journalists in the room, so thank you very much. We, when we talk about Canadian competitiveness, mm -hmm. we can't, and they just, we just heard it reiterated. I'm sure it's been a, I was at work, but I'm sure it's been a theme all day long. You can't avoid. Uh, resources to Tidewater, right? This is the subject of, and it's so easy to say, get the pipeline built, yeah. get the expansion done. Uh, it is not easy to do. Bill C-69 might be just about to make it impossible. What, in terms of policies you would put in place around that issue, what does that look like? How do you solve this? I think it's so exciting for anybody to be able to go out and start talking about the things that are coming, the future, data and information and technology, all that stuff is really exciting. And we are rushing headlong to that scenario and to that world where we're gonna be in and my kids will be in that business and their kids will be in that business. But we still have a pretty big book of business when it comes to resources. And we've got a lot of Canadians employed in the resource sector. Mm -hmm. And that's mining, it's oil and gas extraction, and manufacturing as well. We want to lump in those three kind of older industries. And you can't abandon those as you seek the future promise. And you need to have equal kinds of energy. And I just think energy meaning putting effort into both aspects. And I, our point of view is we are suffering on the resource side. We're suffering on the manufacturing side. Uh, especially in foreign direct investment, yeah. and that goes to co competitiveness and whether or not we have the right climate for this kind of investment. And our plan would be to make it more attractive for people to invest in those sectors again, because there are still good investments are to be had in Canada. We just can't be a one-trick pony. It doesn't make sense for us to jump off of a resource retail, manufacturing kind of country and then suddenly jump over to wanting to be the, the uh, information data, because we're kind of behind the ball from what I've been rating in terms of getting into that boat so all of a sudden. So that's, that's an admirable goal. How do you mm -hmm. achieve it? How do you make it more attractive to invest yeah. in those spaces? Lorraine said it already, energy corridors. So Energy West is important. We know where the pipelines are there. There's a lot of interest. We talk about the Energy Corridor East, being from Cape Breton Island, I'm still very interested in ensuring that people have the choice to use natural gas instead of coal. People still burn coal in Cape Breton, especially if you worked at DEFCO, uh, or fuel oil. Uh, that the train. I remember one time I was, I was out home and I brought my kids with me and one of those old, old tanks was on the side of the road because that's how you dispose of it, I guess. I, not, not really, but that's how we did it in Cape Breton. But nonetheless, he said, what is that? And I said, well, a truck comes to your house and just like in a car, they take the spigot, they plug it into your house and it fills your house with oil and then you burn that. And he thought that was crazy. And we certainly do need to make an energy corridor, so at least the option for cleaner natural gas to be burned it, for, uh, for home heating is a, is a possibility. What would you do? What's the first order of business on Trans Mountain? Oh, on Trans Mountain. Depends on where we are at the moment. Who knows what's going to happen? I, there's so much. Uh, I'm going to take a crazy guess and say we're nowhere. We're no <laughs> Come October, nothing has changed. Crazy guess? Just yeah. Throwing it out there. Well, we own it. Um, obviously, the first thing that we will do is try to figure out if there's private sector interest, whether or not it's been de-risked enough. Yep. Take a look seriously at what consultations have happened. And finally, take a look at where it is in the courts, because that's probably where it's going to be. And then do a risk analysis of whether or not you move forward. We, as uh, Lorraine mentioned, you know, setting up energy corridors will be a piece of our portfolio. Andrew already talked about that in uh, some unveiling of what we plan on doing. And, you know, 
It starts at home as well. It starts in the government. In order to get that foreign investment to come back to invest in Trans Mountain or in any other pipeline, you need to show that the government isn't on a three-year binge of high taxes and high deficits. So a lot of it's going to have to do with government spending, showing that there's going to be some prudence, showing that we are looking at the fact that high taxes is not a future scenario we want, and wrestling deficits back to control. And that's what we can do. That's what we can do as a government. Do you, is that going to be a core platform or an election theme that we need to get our finances back in order? I think it always will be. I mean, Andrew said that our first order of business is going to repeal the carbon tax uh, backstop. That has a lot to do with uh, competitiveness, as it does the fact that we're not convinced it's actually going to cause emissions to be reduced. And, and that debates, of course, in Ontario and Alberta, Manitoba and uh, New Brunswick. Um, so that's a big part of it, but certainly we've never been shy about the fact that we don't like these deficits and that the goal is to make sure that we get back to balance. How long it's going to take, that will be unveiled in the platform, but it uh, depends upon where we are at that point in time. Would you, would you leave yourself, um, at least theoretically now, an opening to not slay deficits if the economy weakens materially? I mean, it, obviously if it weakens precipitously, everybody expects you to spend, but yeah. is there some middle ground where actually letting it stimulate still is a good thing to do? It's a good question, and I would say this, that in 2008 when I was out going door to door during the election, we thought we were gonna be coming in again with a surplus, that we would be coming in with lots of money to pay down the debt, lots of money to give to programming, to put into green infrastructure technology, we did all that kind of stuff, and then the bottom fell out of the United States in terms of the recession came, mm -hmm. and then we had a completely tack and change. I think you always need to be prepared for that, and, but you still need to set out for Canadians what your goal is going to be. And there's nothing wrong with saying, despite external forces that are beyond our control, we believe if everything is perfect, this is the way that we should go, taking into consideration shocks that happen. But massive shocks like that, I don't think anybody can possibly be thinking about it and, and banking on that as part of their risk profile. Are you surprised, um, it's a bit of a leading question, I'm surprised at how far Canadians have come in their thinking from the importance of zero deficits. Mm -hmm. It's almost as though they forget what a deficit is, which is just overspending. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, but Canadians don't, is, is it an election issue? Do they care enough? Oh yeah, yeah they do. do I they? think that, yeah, they do care because, because they were told it's okay to go into debt for two years and then we're gonna bring it back to to normal, to balance, and I think they actually think that's still going to be what they'd like to have at the end of the day. Because Canadians living on credit cards understand very full well just how bad it can get and how far behind the eight ball you can be. And it's they don't remember, though, um, the concerns that we had, for example, when the debt financing in this country was, I don't know, 34 percent of, uh, of, of what we were dealing with in terms of GDP in the budget. And that is just not... That is not sustainable for us. So when we go door to door, our job as politicians is to link these deficits to the possibility of when we have to pay this back, there's only two ways to do it. It's economic growth or it's gonna be through taxes. And if the economy is tanking, guess what it's gonna be? And it does have an impact on how you view your health care or how you view your social assistance transfers because all of that comes into play, unfortunately. If we get uh, a few months in, and it, there's evidence, and I don't know whether there would be, but let's just say there's evidence that uh, the carbon backstops in the four provinces are working. In other words, it's changing consumer... Hallelujah. ...a changing consumer behavior. Ah. Would, would you change your view about removing them? In other words, if it seems to be reducing our consumption of carbon. Yeah. Well, we have BC as an example, and BC has had a carbon tax. Their emissions have gone up. Uh, and their gas prices are pretty high, and the government in BC is considering whether or not they're going to intervene and give people money back because gas prices are too high. So to me, that is not a working model of a carbon tax revenue neutral that's actually de um, delivering on what the promise was. So no, we're no carbon tax. We're no to it. It's a firm no. Um, and we believe that emissions reductions is absolutely imperative. We have to do it as a country, but we also believe that the provinces have to have their plans respected. Ontario has a plan, Manitoba has a plan, so does New Brunswick, and so will Alberta. And if they're not enough to meet our targets, as they are not? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's going to be, 
Ontario says that it's going to be enough for them to meet their targets. Alberta, we'll have to see what ends up happening there because their economic growth by, by default in, in, indicates more emissions targets. But that's the role where the Federation comes in. That's where all the, the provincial premiers and the prime minister sits down or the ministers through their federal provincial tables as well sit down and determine the path forward to make sure everyone's got to do their piece. Municipalities are doing their piece. And together we do get to the emissions reductions that we need as a country while still maintaining prosperity and jobs. One of the most um, politically sensitive conversations we can possibly have, if we're talking about uh, energy corridors, uh, expansion of Trans Mountain, is the relationship with Indigenous peoples. Um, it is hugely complicated. Um, and when I flippantly say Bill C-69 means nothing will ever get built, mm -hmm. that's part of the reason there, is it that we're introducing a new era of consultation uh, and rights that may well make it impossible for mm -hmm. any major infrastructure project to go across borders. Yeah. Toughest question There was question no question in there. <laughs> no, I know, but it's, the, it's a great t jumping off point for a discussion because it is, it is incredibly serious and incredibly important, and one can't trump the other. Either way, right. one can't trump the other. So what you need to do and what we should do is make sure that we respect the rules that the court sits down in terms of consultation. And uh, I will say, however, that we have been very clear that when it comes to protests of these massive resource projects and environmental issues, specifically not on the indigenous reconciliation side, that foreign funded companies coming in to try to impede the economic activity of Canada is not acceptable and there should not be foreign money in there and they should not be funding, um, for the lack of a better word, people just trying to obstruct a process in order to ensure that capital just gets tired and walks away. You know, we're last, we're last in terms, it takes us, how long does it take for us to get a permit? In Australia, it's between six and nine months and in Canada, it's between two and four years. It's ridiculous. Can we move the dial on that? Are there changes you can make? Yeah, that would I think you can. I mean, when I was Natural Resources Minister, we took a look at how you can make streamlining. It comes down to making sure there's no duplication, making sure that you're, you're working together uh, on the process, and you just take the red tape out. This, we've seen a big commitment, um, as you alluded to, to um, so the digital economy, AI. Um, there's a whole new sort of sphere. We've got these great new um, hubs that have emerged. Do we double down there? Do we, wh what's your, your would-be government's approach to yeah. how you would handle those? Well, I, um, I did read Sean Spears and Robert Aslan's um, yep. uh, paper. Uh, I have to tell you, it's, there's a lot of thought that's going to have to be put into the concepts that they're putting forward right now. It, I think it's a new way of thinking, and I think I agree 100% that if there's something we can put aside in a partisanship, this is something that we have to get our act together, because my understanding is that we're so far behind the ball as it is now that we're not even talking in the same language in Ottawa that they're talking in Washington when it comes to this, this new world. And if uh, we're not doing it in Ottawa in a public policy kind of way, then we really need to be educated, be aware, and get moving on it. And just be uh, practical and pragmatic about what, the, what is really going on as opposed to what we wish was going on. And I'll give you an example. It's great that the Prime Minister went to Silicon Valley and went to Amazon and Facebook and everywhere else and Google trying to, to bring them here. Mm -hmm. But is that the right thing for us to do? Is that what we want? Do we want Google coming in and gobbling up all the AI? Is that something that's good for the economic well-being of Canada? And I can't make policy promises here, but I can tell you, I am, I am very interested in the notion that the Investment Canada Act should take into consideration some of these issues and whether or not this technology field is a field that should be treated along the same lines as banking, communications, and uh, other areas which we have uh, more of an interest for our greater good of the nation. And there is, a, I think, a whole panel discussion coming up on that subject. Reasonable people can have a healthy debate about the role these companies can and should play in our economy. Uh, it's it's late in the game to yeah. to disinvite them. Uh, is there a way to to use them to our advantage now that they're here? Have to be. I mean, there has to be. You can't um, just like I, I say that you cannot ignore the old dirty industries as you try to create a new economic Canada. You can't ignore what you currently have in place, and you have to work with them and around them. But you know, 
Mr. Balsilli is raising some serious concerns about what's happening just down the corner mm -hmm. in uh, sidewalk labs in terms of surveillance and, and the capitalization of surveillance. These are really big issues where we are making business decisions today without possibly having all the information of the long-term impact on our economy or, or on our society. Big issues. And you know what the other scary part about it is? The average Canadian voter is not even aware this conversation is happening or what it means. And they're the ones that elect governments. It's a bit of a subject shift, but we're going to run okay. out of time. Omnibus bills, yeah. uh, they tend to be um, out of favor for opposition, and then the minute the opposition is in government, in favor again. I know. Um, we got a, a, a new budget with a non-budgetary item in the form of refugees. Would you, would you pledge to do away with the omnibus? Do we need a 934-page budget? I wish I could, but I will tell you that having been a minister who really wanted to get last-minute legislation through a process in our government very quickly with an assurance that it was going to get passed, that's where omnibus bills are attractive. And there are two other pieces of legislation embedded in this one, and one is the complete change of CATSA, which is the Canadian Screening Agency yep. for Transportation. Big changes there. Pilotage authority too, complete changing and how, who owns what and who takes over what. So I don't enjoy not having the ability to debate these bills separately. I understand where they're coming from. I don't condone it. However, I also cannot tie the hinds of the next government. I will not fetter the discretion of the prime minister in terms of what he Are there some issues like that do. don't belong in an omnibus? Well, the speaker will tell you that, and that's why the speaker will divide it all up and send it to the appropriate committee. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's not, it just shortens out the amount of time that you can have a good discussion. And quite frankly, sometimes you do turn things up in committee that need a little bit more time mm -hmm. than seven minutes. And, and one of the good examples is where we find ourselves today with SNC-Lavalin and the Deferred Prosecution Agreement. Oh, you got it in under the wire. Of, a minute 50. <laughs> Damn. You gave me the question, Amanda. <laughs> I which didn't was say DPA. I did not say DPA. Bill. Um, I'm st hey, I'm not being too partisan up here. No, no. not any more than it is impossible for you not to be. No. Um, you hope to form the government. Yeah. You will, uh, obviously there will be an election campaign that we hope is about more than SNC-Lavalin. I hope anyway. Um, what, do you, what do you hope is the galvanizing issue? If you, could, no. if you could say to Canadians, this is what the conversation we need to be having and this is what my, if I form the government, this is what the government stands for. What is that? Okay. So I will tell you what I think that the issue will be based upon my door knocking, and it's not SNC-Lavalin, and it's not the carbon tax necessarily, but what it is, it's very interesting to me. It's a group of people in my age group between 35 and 55 who um, have been told all their lives this is their earning years, and they're finding that there's no upward mobility for them anywhere, and they don't know where to go, and they're thinking, I bought into something, and it's not coming true for me and the housing prices are so expensive and what's going to happen to my kids and education is expensive. And that's the conversation I'm having at the door. It's not about Canada's competitiveness. It's not about foreign direct investment. It's not about economic roundtables. It's about what's happening to me. It's the middle class. How, I don't even know if they're middle class or not, but what's happening to me what, and, and how am I going to live my life? Um, politicians and policy people think about what's the benefit of the country in the mm -hmm. next hundred years. Great people think about how I'm going to get to the mortgage payment at the end of the week. And that is, I think it's very individualistic, and I think that is what we're going to be held to account. And the plan that best suits their dreams and desires is the one that will win. And uh, we'll probably talk a little bit about SNC along the way, too. <laughs> no doubt. But no comments on here. Pretty guaranteed about that. Last question for you, and that is we are seeing a renewed east-west divide in this country that really seemed to have disappeared um, and it, we're, we seem to be back to tensions for the west against the east in a new way. Can we fix that? Is there a... Yeah, of course. How, what do we do? Um, what you do is you... Build you, pipelines? You let, them, you, you let them use the resources that they were given a, as a province to utilize and not put limits on them that are so harsh that it renders them unable to have an economy. If they need to transition their economy because of what's happening in the world, then they will figure out a way to transition it. But to have artificial means that stop them from having you know, their ability for their kids to do better. That's what I said, this is very individualistic mm -hmm. how it hits people in the heart. 
And that's how you end up with populist movements, right? When you leave whole chunks of people behind in your willingness to chase the Googles and the alphabets of the world to come and work here because it's great for the future in 40 years. However, there's a lot of people going, but you know, I'm here now and uh, what's gonna matter to me? So yes, it can be fixed, absolutely. And I think whatever stripe of government is elected across the country in provinces or feds, um, that at the very beginning at least, there will be a willingness to work with one another. Uh, and then we get closer to election and then all falls apart. But I believe that. I have to be optimistic, you know? Um, I have to be. Now, when you say east-west divide, I think Atlantic Canada versus Ontario sometimes <laughs> as well. Fair enough. So I get it. But the, you know, Amanda, you put your finger on something. There is a real anger. Mm -hmm. and there's a real anger. And it's kind of like, you know, we were there for you in the recession. Because during that recession, 09, 10, it was the direct investment in the oil sands and in our commodities that actually kept our country moving yep. along. And they were there for us. We should be there for them. We need to leave it there. Appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Thank Lisa you. Wright. Thank you.